Well, thank you all uh, for coming to uh, today's Council on Foreign Relations meeting. Um, the subject is the Great Society, its meaning uh, and impact. Um, I think over the course of modern American history, there have been two great government revolutions, if you will, uh, the New Deal and the Great Society, and uh, a major counter-revolution. Uh, and we're still dealing with uh, uh, the implications of, of all of them. Uh, the Great Society, which was uh, so named by Lyndon Johnson, uh, first in a speech he gave at the University of Michigan in 1964, uh, embraced an extraordinary uh, number of government programs that LBJ uh, sought to use to address basically what he thought were the deficiencies, deficiencies left over from the great, uh, from rather the New Deal. Um, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, Head Start programs, consumer and environmental protections like the, uh, the Clean Air Act, uh, the Voting Rights Act uh, to deal with racial injustice. It was an extraordinary uh, array of programs um, uh, enacted in, in a period of time that was just as extraordinarily short uh, by the 89th Congress uh, from January 65 to January 67. Basically, that was where most of it was enacted. Uh, and uh, that Congress uh, has been deemed by historians uh, to have been probably the most productive in American history uh, Grover certainly would, would uh, disagree with perhaps the, uh, the term used there. Um, and then for, you know, for those who, who doubt uh, the so-called great man theory of history, um, I think it's interesting to note that, uh, that LBJ's idol was FDR, was uh, Franklin Roosevelt. He went into his accidental presidency uh, consciously intending uh, to live up to the ideals uh, as he saw it that FDR had put in place in the New Deal. Um, and for a very brief period of time in American history, LBJ arguably had uh, as much power uh, as FDR did at the very beginning stages uh, of the New Deal in terms of the, uh, uh, the vast number of Democrats that came into Congress uh, and uh, the impact of the 1964 election in which uh, an uber conservative uh, named Barry Goldwater was, uh, was badly beaten in the worst landslide in American history, uh, sending the conservatives for cover for the same period when many of these programs were enacted. But I mean, just as so many of these programs uh, continue today, uh, are debated today, um, and in fact, I, you know, we're going to uh, lace our discussion today with uh, uh, the State of the Union address by the President last night uh, in which uh, Obama, you know, kind of in some respects laid out his own uh, vision for uh, addressing deficiencies left over as he perceives it from what hasn't worked since the Great Society. Uh, but as the, the concept of the Great Society lives on, so does the backlash, uh, the counter-revolution, if you will. Uh, we all are somewhat familiar with how it ended overspending Vietnam, the, the disaster of the late Johnson presidency, uh, followed by uh, into the 1970s, the period of stagflation, all of which, of course, laid the groundwork for uh, the Reagan revolution, uh, which is the counter-revolution I was referring to. Uh, and that way of thinking, uh, right up to the present day, right up to the Tea Party, uh, is also a legacy that we're dealing with. Uh, uh, even though uh, Reagan himself uh, failed to roll back government. Uh, no other uh, Republican president has. We know Richard Nixon, for example, after taking over uh, from LBJ, uh, quickly sought the center uh, and embraced many great society programs. Um, and of course, right up to uh, President George W. Bush, who not only did not roll back uh, Medicare, he added prescription drugs uh, to that program. So in so many respects, uh, despite the rhetoric of counter-revolution, we have seen a failure uh, to really roll back the Great Society, and that's one of the things we're going to be uh, discussing today. And for that discussion, um, we could not have two, uh, a better cast of characters, let me put it that way, uh, than uh, Governor Howard Dean, uh, former governor of Vermont, of course, and former chairman of the Democratic National Committee, 
uh, who will be taking the affirmative. <laughs> no. uh, and Grover Norquist uh, is president for the Americans for Tax Reform, uh, but is known to all of us, perhaps, and has been for many years uh, as uh, what I would say is the chief scold uh, of, the, uh, of the Republicans and conservatives in Washington in terms of uh, uh, his uh, attempts to, uh, to continue to roll back government. Uh, and I, even though what we have here may be more in the nature of a debate uh, than a typical CFR discussion. We are going to try to keep it a, a discussion as much as possible, uh, rather than turning it into something that might foreshadow uh, what we're going to see in the 2016 presidential uh, uh, campaign. So uh, with that, uh, I want to start out. Uh, Governor Dean, perhaps you could just give us your overall assessment uh, of the impact of the Great Society then and now and, and how its, its legacy lingers on. Sure, and this is going to be a hard one to so you're going to have to cut me off, and I'm not going to be offended be if you do. Play. So uh, let me, uh, I actually now, as part of my many part-time jobs, teach uh, foreign policy at Yale at the Jackson Institute, which means I also have to teach American history, because a lot of kids don't know a lot about American history. And I've learned a lot uh, just preparing for the, for the class. Um, I, um, I hated Lyndon Johnson. Uh, I was a student in college when he was lying to us about the Vietnam War, um, and I was a fairly no lo low number in the draft. Uh, in fact, ha actually had the physical and flunked it. Um, and uh, I now believe Lyndon Johnson was one of the five great presidents in American history, simply because I judge presidents by what they achieved and, and the changes they made. Uh, and uh, the changes have been extraordinary. Uh, I also look at this from a sort of a human evolutionary point of view. I think uh, while we all have a libertarian streak, particularly in America, whether we're Democrats or Republicans, we also have a communitarian streak. And over the last 10,000 years of American history, I think we've become more, I mean of, uh, of human history, I think we've become more communitarian. So I actually see, see uh, the, the, uh, the Roosevelt, the New Deal, and the Great Society as an evolutionary movement in the world because, it's, of course, it's happened in other countries as well, which means we, we, we actually, it's a, it's a fundamental difference in philosophy that I think we have with, with uh, the Republicans and the true libertarians. Uh, I believe that we are recognizing as human beings that we have responsibility to each other. And it's not just every person for themselves, that bald capitalism without rules doesn't work, uh, and that there have to be a set of rules to make capitalism work. And the question is then, in the constraints of what we've agreed to, how do you make it work? So I think there never has been a counter-revolution. There's a lot of talk about the Rev Re Reagan revolution, but as Michael pointed out, there's not been much real change. And I think I, I happen to be fiscally conservative. Grover would probably disagree with that, but actually I was, I was once ranked fourth in the country in terms of fiscal responsibility when I was governor. and, and um, uh, they told me they had to redo the results five times before they'd release them, and I was still number four in the country in terms of my conservative. They couldn't believe it, but I think fiscal conservatism is actually, con is actually uh, uh, compatible with a, a, an aspect of responsibility for each other, because you can't, if you can't fund the programs, you shouldn't have them, and you eventually have to cut them. So I do think Johnson transformed society. I think it was part of an evolutionary transportation, uh, transformation. Uh, and I think it's for the better. Now, do we have to fix some of these programs? Are they going to make us broke? Yes, we do have to fix some of these programs. I am very interested in how we fix them. I'm not interested in getting rid of them. I'm not interested in privatizing them. I'm not interested in turning them back to the states. And I think there'll be a lot of discussion uh, today about what we should do to fix these programs. And I will just say, leading into what whatever Grover may say in rebuttal, something that he's probably going to agree with, we, we cannot continue on the current fiscal course that we're on. My view is that we ought to, as Bill Clinton famously said about welfare, we ought to mend it, not end it. Grover? Yeah, you mentioned the two periods of, uh, of, of government expansion. It's actually uh, rather tight. <laughs> uh, the, uh, between the 34 and 36 election, you saw Social Security and aid to families with dependent children. And between the 64 and 66 election, you saw the Great Society spending programs, Medicaid, Medicare. Uh, federal government right now spends 20% of what Americans earned this last year. It was 24% before we got the sequester and uh, wrestled the president uh, on that. 
and not allowing them to raise taxes up to 24, uh, but to bring spending down to 20. <coughs> but of the 20, half, 10% of everything you earn um, and half of federal spending uh, was created in two two-year periods, so in four years of American history. So and some of our friends on the left talk about the consensus, if you grab power for two years at a time and run things through, uh, you can pass some very consequential legislation. And they did. Um, in 66, the Republicans won back in a wave. And then in 68, they did. This was supposed to be, we're supposed to be in the middle of the third wave. This was Obama's uh, hope that this would be another period where we jump up government spending on a permanent uh, basis. And it's very interesting to watch the different reaction, both by Republicans and by the general electorate. Uh, after the creation of uh, Obamacare ACA, uh, the public remains opposed to it. It remains unhappy with it. would like to see it dramatically changed, altered, uh, gotten rid of. And it didn't get a single Republican vote, unlike the previous periods where you had a bipartisan march towards uh, bigger government. We now have in the Republican Party, post Reagan, and post Tea Party, a party committed to actually smaller government. We didn't have that before. If you watched eight years of Bush and eight and uh, four and a half years of Republican Congresses during the eight years of Bush's presidency, uh, during that period, he just kept spending money. And not spending money and spending less money wasn't even on the to-do list. When you talked to the guys there at the strategic group, not spending more money wasn't <laughs> ever on the list. They call, no, they call it the strategic group themselves. They at least had a sense of humor, not other things. Uh, on the costs of the great um, society, uh, well, we spent $20 trillion on, uh, since 1964 in inflation-adjusted dollars on the uh, welfare programs. 17% of personal income in the United States now comes from means-tested welfare programs, not Social Security, where you pay and theoretically getting something back, or uh, Medicare, but where you just get something because you have low income, nothing else necessary. This last year, 2012, $700 billion uh, spent. But of course, the real challenge is that we can't afford this very well now, and we certainly can't afford it in the future. Social Security has a $10.6 trillion unfunded liability. That doesn't mean $10.6 trillion owed sometime. That's the present value of the unfunded liabilities that we have in Social Security alone. Medicare, somewhere between $28 and $35 trillion in unfunded liabilities. Um, when Medicare was built, the costs in 1990 were 644 percent higher than they said they were going to be when the government put them in. It turns out it's only 150 percent if you adjust for inflation. So they're only off by 150 percent then. Uh, looking forward, here's a quote from Paul Ryan in 2011 talking about the Congressional Budget Office run by Democrats. The CBO has a model where they measure the economy going forward and they're telling us that the entire economy crashes in the year 2037. Their computer simulator cannot conceive any way in which the economy continues given the entitlements that we have. 2037, you can see that. Some of us may live to see it. Um, and so when we talk about you know, was this a good idea? One, these are the costs. And then we get, we can have longer or different conversation about what the costs were in human lives and families damaged and neighborhoods uh, damaged and what benefits there were or weren't. And then the other thing to talk about is what else could we have done? I mean, theoretically, everybody agrees we need to, we need to change things before we hit the wall in 2037 or sooner. Um, why didn't we do this in 1965? Why are we waiting till now to do this? Why six years of Obama saying he wanted to fix entitlements and nothing? He just added to entitlements like Bush. Um, so that's, uh, as, as you look forward, we can go through the, uh, the, the costs uh, and the alternatives as we move forward. Because I, I think we can fix things, and I think we will. Um, I mean, very briefly, before I give Governor Dean a chance to respond to that, uh, do you want to just sort of sum up what you think were the opportunity costs? And again, we, we don't want to talk just purely in economic numbers here because this was a program to transform society, specifically to deal with uh, uh, income and racial divides, uh, educational uh, divides. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, listening to the president last night, um, he, his community college program, I mean, on a much smaller scale, he's trying to deal with the same thing. So could you just briefly address what you think <coughs> our country would be like if we hadn't done Great Society? Well, um, I'm looking at the seven-minute speech that uh, uh, LBJ gave when he announced at, in Ann Arbor the, the Great Society. This is the same speech that Obama <coughs> gave um, last night. Uh, you could take the whole thing without changing uh, a word, because there are no dates except 50 years from now. He has to be judged on it, by the way, in 50 years. Um, and they haven't exactly accomplished what they want to. It's actually much more aggressive than you said. I mean, they've, they've got plans for our, our leisure time. They've got it, they're worried about unbridled growth in the economy. They have to do something about that. Love to have growth of any kind, bridled or not. Um, I mean, this is, we're, we're going to be condemned to a soulless wealth. Wealth to start with would be good. Um, I mean, this is just, I mean, this is Savonarola. This is not a guy who just wants to increase GDP 2%. This is a guy who's in, in, going to be in charge of your soul or, uh, through the government. But we're going to do it by having working groups and White House conferences and meetings. But the solution to these problems did not rest on a massive program in Washington. Really, what part of the thing that they did wasn't a massive program based out of Washington. Um, on you know, damaging, well, uh, I passed out uh, a comparison of what happened when Reagan was president in terms of uh, workforce participation. As the economy grew, more people came back into the workforce, and workforce participation grew. As this economy has recovered, workforce participation has fallen which is why the only reason the unemployment numbers are going down is because of the number of people quitting looking for work. If you counted them in, we'd be at 10 or 11 percent um, uh, uh, as we move forward. The cost to the United States we have today, um, well, I, I did pass out this chart. Poverty was falling up until they passed the Great Society. And then, according to the government's own statistics, static for 50 years. We're a little higher than it was when they didn't. Uh, if the government wants to argue their statistics or their definition of poverty are no good, they can, but those are the government's numbers. Uh, it is not something that was a problem. It wasn't getting better. It was getting significantly better rapidly, and then it stopped getting better um, after they did that. <coughs> the number of men who left the workforce as a result of uh, this program and immediately um, after 16% uh, of men over 20 were not working or looking for work in 1965 when they started passing these bills, 28% today. If you look at people between 20, men between 20 and 64, 6% 6 of the civilian non-institutionalized men were out of the workforce when they passed these laws. Today it's 17%. <coughs> the damage done to heads of households, the damage done uh, in how, what the government has done there, uh, the, the lack of progress on the okay. poverty rate all suggest to me, it, it, and then you can track crime and government spending, crime and uh, the inaction of all these laws, and make your own decisions. Okay. Uh, well, Governor, a lot of bold claims there, starting with President Obama, Savonarola. Uh, maybe you want to. Oh, no, no, no. That was LBJ as Savonarola. Ah, LBJ, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Obama's mini Savonarola. <laughs> Go ahead, <laughs> sir. Um, I, you know, I, 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 we're speaking a foreign language here. Um, what I look at was why Social Security started and why Medicare started. When Social Security was started, it was actually started in the states because the Depression, not, as we are not taught in school, did not start with the 1929 stock market crash. It started in 1926 when the agriculture markets began to crash all over the world, not just in the United States. And uh, old people who were surviving on their farms because, and they couldn't work anymore had nothing and were literally in danger of starvation. That's what Kansas and Nebraska and places like that is where Social Security started. What, what Roosevelt did with his let's try keep trying stuff until uh, something works, which is basically what he said, is he looked at other programs. And these programs came from the states, and he adopted them and created a national uh, program uh, for Social Security. I think Social Security has been incredibly important because uh, I think a, a, a minimum standard of living is important in this country. We have, in my view, the greatest problem in this country today, that the greatest threat to democracy is the gap between those at the top and those at the bottom. Not because I'm against making money. I'm actually very interested in, I think,
capitalism is the greatest system we've ever, it's ever been invented. But like every other system, if you have no rules, the whole system collapses. And it very nearly did in 2008. So if we're going to have a system where it's possible to make large amounts of money, which it is, which I think is a good thing, uh, we've got to have a system where everybody believes that it works for them. And that's the danger to this country right now. 80% of the people in this country have not seen a raise for the last 20 years. Almost all the wealth that's been accumulated in this country, particularly coming out of this recession, has gone to the top 20%. Now, the, I, I don't have a problem with people being rich and people not being rich. I do have a problem with people not affording the basic necessities, which we've more or less fixed in this country, for basically. We'd have arguments with some of my more liberal friends about that. What I have a problem with is if 80% of the people in the system believe the system doesn't work for them. It doesn't matter if you argue that it does work for them, because if they believe it doesn't, the whole system is dead. That would be a terrible shame for this extraordinary country that we've built over the last 235 years. So I think a, some sort of minimal standard of living. I, I was the first governor in the country by two weeks, uh, beating Tommy Thompson by two weeks, which I'm thrilled to say, who did welfare reform. Why did we do welfare reform? Because I fundamentally believe you shouldn't get something for nothing unless you really are disabled. That's not the same as saying there shouldn't be some kind of minimal standard where everybody can participate. The reason the health care costs have been so outrageous and the Medicare projections, as Grover uh, pointed out, are so outrageous is very little to do with Medicare. It has to do with the fact that the health care industry is completely out of control. Why? Because the economics doesn't work. And why is that? Because you pay me to do as much stuff as I possibly can to you, whether it works or not. Who, there's no other system in the world that works like that. You've got to have a basic fee for patient system. If you keep paying me to do stuff, I'm going to keep doing it to you. And that's why the medical costs have gone up at three times the rate of inflation. The reason Medicare is out of control is not because Medicare is a bad program. It's because health care costs are out of control. We have to be serious about dealing with health care costs. So I, I, I defend this system of basically a minimal standard of living. Health care came in uh, under Johnson because health care costs were driving older people not to be able to be adequately taken care of. Life expectancy has gone up dramatically. I won't claim it's only because of Medicare, but that certainly had a lot to do with it. Medicaid has turned out to be the most effective way of expanding access to health care. We used it 20 years ago in my state, and every kid in my state under 18 has had health insurance for 20 years. So I am, a, I am not a person who believes we ought to keep spending more money on social programs. And I agree uh, in principle with the, the dilemma that Grover has laid out. We've got to deal with this stuff. We have a, a budget problem that isn't going to go away unless we make some fundamental changes. But I am not philosophically interested in dismantling the great society. Uh, just before I let Glo Grover respond to that, I just wanted to follow up. I mean, what you laid out, all the problems we're dealing with today, starting with inequality, poverty, I mean, doesn't that mean that the great society failed in the end? It, it just no, it means, that, it means that the rules of capitalism have been skewed. And if you look at what von Hayek actually wrote, the penalty in a capitalist society for making big mistakes has to be failure. We don't have that penalty in this country. This is what Elizabeth Warren's talking about. I think the conservatives ought to love Elizabeth Warren. It's perfectly plain to me, not because I'm an Elizabeth Warren liberal, or you can call me whatever you want, um, it, it's perfectly plain to me that if you have 10 or 15 or 20 institutions around the world, that if they fail, the entire Western uh, ec economic system collapses, that you have no choice but to bail them out, unpopular as that was. If you don't bail them out, we all go back to living in conditions that were before the Great Depression, which includes some people in this room who were reasonably well off, as happened in the Great Depression. So you either have to have a lot of regulation, which I'm not that crazy about, or you have to have rules in capitalism which let capitalism really work. And capitalism hasn't worked as well as it could have. It has worked well enough to lift this country to the, the highest standard of living, essentially, in the world if you adjust for demography and so forth and so on. But it hasn't worked well enough so that we've taken the kinks out of it so there can ad be adequate distribution of wealth. We're not talking about socialism or making sure everybody pays a 90% tax rate as they did when LBJ was president. We know that doesn't work. But what we, I do believe is that in a capitalist society, there have to be rules so that everybody has some skin in the game and some investment in making capitalism succeed. And that's the danger I see in this country. Yeah. Over. Yeah. You sound in defending these programs, but we're going to fix them. Uh, like my f Republican friends who say, <coughs> the Iraq war wasn't a mistake, but we're never doing that again. <laughs> um, and I think you have to go back and uh, look at the damage that these programs did. 
they made things worse than they would have been. Okay, they took half of the, the government over um, today. Uh, Social Security, for instance, if, this is not an idea out of Kansas, this is an idea out of Germany. Um, Social Security was thought up by uh, our friend who unified the German state. Um, and the whole, his project, uh, it doesn't transfer well over here. Um, Social Security uh, isn't an investment program. We're now today in the states. Uh, and private sectors almost all shifted over, with the exception of some unionized companies, from defined benefit plans to defined contribution plans, 401ks, IRAs. Um, and if you don't have that, you do end up with people making all sorts of commitments into the future, and the workers get screwed, and the companies go bankrupt, and consumers uh, get cheated. Uh, and the private sector has largely shifted that over. We're now are going state by state and moving from defined benefit plans where politicians would promise you the world today because by the time you collect an uncollectible and unpayable pension because it's promising more than the government's willing to take, I'll be dead or out of office and it's somebody else's problem. Uh, so states, Utah's completely shifted over to defined uh, contribution. Number of other states, uh, Michigan at the state level completely shifted over um, back in 1990. Uh, and more and more states are moving in that direction. Um, had we done Social Security that way, we wouldn't have a $10 trillion unfunded liability. If you fixed it, Ryan and uh, Congressman Ryan and Senator Sununu put forward a plan that the Social Security actuary um, went and, and raided. And he said, look, if you'd phased in allowing you to take your FICA taxes and putting them in a 401k that you control, and people over 55 stay in the old system, everybody else moves over to the new one, um, by 2024, we'd have $7 trillion in those accounts. Why do we have inequality of wealth in this country? Because we take the income that um, low-income people and young people make, and we take it in Social Security taxes, and we tell you it's savings, but it's not. If it was savings, low-income people would actually have savings. They'd have resources to share with their family. Um, they would be able to uh, uh, handle those. and. $7 trillion, fairly evenly spread out across the country, so Social Security, so everybody's in, um, would dramatically change the inequality that, in terms of wealth accumulation in this country, Social Security created and made possible and made it difficult for people to save for their future, particularly, I mean, rich people can save for their future, but low-income people um, find that Social Security takes their money and they can't. Uh, and by the way, you could not only do that, but drop the FICA tax from what would be 20% if nothing was done, down to 5% in order to deal with disability uh, and some of the non-saving portions of Social Security. Uh, if we look at uh, Medicaid, if we block granted that to the states, as we have done uh, with aid to families of dependent children, I know uh, under Clinton, Clinton did this, I know that the left says the world would end. Well, they all said that when we, when, um, Clinton signed the third bill that the Republicans passed to move uh, uh, aid to families of dependent children, now TANF, out to the states. So you have 50 states trying 50 different things. What, what our friends the statists miss is that one of the reasons the governments don't do very, governments can blow things up, um, but they're not very good um, at creating wealth um, they, um, or uh, creating uh, new innovations going into the future. Uh, and the reason is, by definition, they're monopoly. The advantage of states over the federal government, it's not this closer to the <coughs> people stuff, um, not any closer to the mayor of DC than I am to the president of the United States in terms of being able to call him on the phone and suggest something. Um, but there are 50 states, some say 57, but at least 50. And um, they can take different approaches. And this is why I think it's very important that we allow the 50 states to take different approaches and let's find out what works. And I think it's obvious that defined contribution pensions are better than defined benefit pensions in terms of being stable and creating wealth for all Americans, not just the Kennedys and the Rockefellers. Um, and that's the missed opportunity. The number of heads of households, people who are out of work because of these programs are devastating there. 
but what Social Security has done in replacing savings and telling poor and middle income people you can't save because we're taking your money, promising you it's being saved in West Virginia somewhere, but it's not, um, has created tremendous inequality. And right. the fact that we have very bad job creation in this country, um, that's one of the reasons why low income people are not doing better. We need to be having okay. more jobs. Very, very briefly before we go to the Okay, so the, the, here's the central dilemma of the argument that we're having. What do you do about the outliers? So in, this, in the case of Social Security and defined contribution, I'm not unwilling to look at that, but the problem is what do you do about the people who are taken advantage of or end up in some investment scheme? Uh, we know there were a lot of people who lost their IRAs in, in the 2008 recession because a lot of the chicanery on Wall Street and some of it was just bad luck, or maybe they just made bad investment decisions and they don't have an IRA. What do they retire on if there's nothing to form, fall back on? And what is our obligation to keep them from starving? Do we have one? Same is true of states. Uh, Texas is my, fi my favorite example. A lot of people moving into Texas. Texas economy doing really great. 22% of the kids, in spite of CHIP, have no health insurance in the state of Texas. 22%. Now, those are American kids, not just Texan kids. I think I have a responsibility for those kids as an American. So the question is, in this, is this area where everything is devolved and everything is, is let's let the states, what about the people who screw up? And what about the kids who don't get health insurance? What obligation do we have as a nation to those children? So I think it's easy to say, oh, well, let's decentralize, let's have defined contributions. There are situations you have to talk about and you have to deal with. We have to define our responsibility for each other. What is it? Do we have any? Because I think if we don't, we're not a nation. We're certainly not going to be a great nation. The last point I want to make is I would disagree with the idea that we don't foster innovation or anything. You know how we foster innovation and wealth creation in this country? I agree the government doesn't do it. No, I don't agree with that. We do it because we provide the absolutely essential creative framework, which is the rule of law. That is the great genius of America and the great genius of our Constitution. We don't do the innovation. We set, a, uh, a, we set forth a table that millions and millions of people come to this country to do their innovation because we have a predictable rule of law. And that we need to focus on. What the rule of law says is that the table is level for everybody, whether you're rich or poor or in between, uh, no matter what your circumstances are, if you're willing to work hard and play by the rules, you can make a lot of money and do well. If we lose that, and if we lose people believing that, then that's when we're in trouble. Right now, I don't think we're in trouble. We've got some things to do. Financially, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got to make some tough decisions. I think the fundamental nature of this country is still sound. But in, in, the, spirit of, what, but in the spirit of bipartisanship, I agree there's a, a role for the government in providing rule of law and protecting property rights and right of contract so that people Okay. Don't cheat each other. No, I'm not no or hurt this. each other. <laughs> uh, let's open it up to Q and A. Please wait for the microphone to come to you and stand and state your name and affiliation and try to keep things as concise as possible. We have less than a half an hour for this. Yes, sir. Right over here. Chris Broughton, Millennium Challenge Corporation. Great discussion, gentlemen. Thank you for being with us here today. Um, first, I want to start with a quote of Paul by Paul Krugman: "The United States government is turning into an insurance company with a standing army." Uh, the second piece is really uh, political. It's the political challenge that we, I don't think we, we've delved into enough about tackling entitlements, um, which both of you, uh, I think, recognize the fiscal threat to. And it's really the NIMBY problem, which is generally used in environmental terms, but not, not in my benefit, yo, we might say, in the entitlements context. So the first piece of that is um, there have been lots of uh, proposals, uh, Bull Simpson, Rivlin, et cetera. None of them have moved forward. There's also the element that when we think about those entitlements, it's actually a resource transfer from blue states to red states. I'm getting my question. Getting I'm, I'm going quick. Um, so the first is how do you tackle the entitlement problem when it's both a red state and a blue state? Everyone benefits, right? And, and, and the second piece of it is it's also structural to the United States economy, right? So Grover, you were talking about the comparison of the great society and conditions then and now and, and, and the role of entitlements in that. But one could argue it's actually more just the structure of the economy. Globalization, uh, mechanization, shift from manufacturing to services is far more to do than, than the entitlement programs in terms of the structure of jobs and employment and so forth. So how do you think about those, both the political problem and also the structure of the economy? Okay, Thank you. Um, look, uh, you and you said, uh, 
I would argue that these programs have made the situation worse, not better, um, because there were alternatives, ways to spend those resources. It could have been done in some cases with 50 states competing to do it differently. Um, I realize that the modern Democratic Party does not like the idea of allowing states to make these decisions. Um, because as you look at it, there are um, 24 states with a Republican governor, Republican House, and Republican Senate. This is shortly after the election when the New York Times announced the modern Republican Party had ceased to exist in the world. Uh, and there are now seven states that the Democrats run completely. Half the country lives under a Republican governor, and uh, fifth, one third of that, uh, one sixth, lives in, under Democratic governance. If you look at the blue, um, the blue states, they're states people tend to leave. And the red states are states that people either have been moving to for a while or continuing to move uh, to. So we, we can tell what works and what doesn't. That's why I suggest uh, that when we discuss what's going to work and what doesn't, we take a look in two years and four years and six years, because these red states are staying red for the rest of the decade, and the blue states stay in blue for the rest of the decade, maybe another 10 years. And we will actually have a, a, a controlled experiment. I had this conversation with a nice lady who runs the Nation uh, magazine, and she turned green because she doesn't think that if you take her ideas and you do them in a state, uh, it'll work. Really stupid ideas can only be done at the national level. If you have, <laughs> if you have a really stupid idea and you do it in Massachusetts, like government-run health care under Dukakis, and then they repealed it as soon as he lost the presidential election because it was just for show, we're not going to live under this, um, you, you can't do that in a state. Vermont just went through a similar conversation about government control of health care. So there's a reason why 50 states are better than a federal government for looking at these sorts of projects. And even better is 300 million Americans minding their own business, doing their own stuff. Oh, thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Yes. I, 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 there's, I, there's nothing I, I, old I, about the idea of I mean, uh, the Constitution. I do like the uh, quote from Paul Krugman, which I hadn't heard, and it, even though this is a bit of an unrelated. Uh, I, it reminds me of John McCain's quote about Russia, a, a gas station posing as a country. I mean, I don't like talking in sound bites, and I really don't like Washington talking point speaking ease, but when you get a really good one, you just got to repeat it. <laughs> um, look, I think we do need changes in entitlements. Um, and the question is, how can we make this, this, these programs survive? I've already talked about why I'm not supportive, particularly of giving the states more flexibility. I was when I was governor. I was the head of the National Governors Association. But I've since, Texas has really just thrown me for a loop. Here's a state with a rising economy that's bragged about by its governor, which not only has 22% of all its children with no health insurance, they're 48th in the country in terms of educational achievement in high school. I mean, I, I don't, we can't risk having the third large, second, third largest state in the country, second largest state in the country population-wise. We can't risk having that many people get out of high school who are ignorant. Um, and so I, I just think there is a federal interest in making sure there's a minimum level of, I support the common core. I don't, I have some problems with some of the testing. Maybe we can look at that. The idea that nine times nine is something other than 81 in states if they choose not to test for it is insane. Mississippi used to dumb down their test to make sure that an adequate number of people passed it to satisfy the Department of Education. This is crazy. We are one country, and if we're not one big country, we're not going to be the most powerful country in the face of the earth. Part of the reason we're as powerful as we are is because we have 310 million people that can generate wealth for common cause among the 50 states. So I, I just think this notion of, I'm very willing to look at the federal uh, programs and see if they can't be changed. I supported the sequester. The reason I supported the sequester was because I thought that no way was anybody ever going to make those cuts if they had to vote on them. Uh, I'm serious about budget cutting, but I'm not serious uh, if we can all punt and hope that somebody at the local level, what makes you think that the local government is any more effective than federal government? We get madder at the federal government, but you know I've seen the legislature in some because, of these places. Because you can leave? Yeah, there is an argument for accountability there. Yeah. But let's, uh, let's I'm sorry, one second. Krugman we... was wrong. I, I, I really apologize for not pointing out. <coughs> you quoted Krugman, and I failed to point out that he was wrong. Uh, the, fed, the federal government is a Ponzi scheme with a standing army, not okay, an insurance company. Very good. Let's go to a, let's go to a question uh, over here. Mike Haltzell, please. 
Please uh, be succinct. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm Mike Halsell from Johns Hopkins Science. Terrific discussion. Look, the one thing we haven't, that you folks really haven't done very much, is put the foreign and council on foreign relations. I'd I mean, unless we think we live on an island and other people's experiences are completely irrelevant, and I don't think either one of you thinks so, I think we have to look at it. I love my country, Mr. Dean, as much as anybody, and we're successful in many ways, but we're not so successful in many ways, whether it's life expectancy or infant mortality or, sc or scores of our, of our students. You can argue about how that's, how, you know, there's some variables there, but the fact is we're not perfect. You talk about Social Security, you alluded to Bismarck and said it's just not transferable. It's, it strikes me, we're, the last time I looked at OECD statistics, we were the third lowest taxed of all the 34 countries. I think Mexico and Chile were taxed lower than we were. So the vast majority are taxed more, and yet these countries that tax more and presumably redistribute more have better, I, I'll use the value word, distribution of wealth than we do. Yet you're saying we ought to go the other direction. I just don't understand that. Oh, and and okay. so my question, I'll just stop and say, could you both maybe discuss a little bit about international comparisons? And I'm saying this, I, I know at a time when Europe's having problems, so I lead with my chin, but that's largely because let's, of... Let's you know. go to that, yeah, particularly since the president in his speech last night, I think, made a big point of saying, you know, we're... Uh, uh, we, we may not be great, but we're doing better than everyone else. Yeah, look, our government sucks less than all the others. <laughs> and I think we should be proud of that. In the discussion, right. Our government, <laughs> it is a matter of patriotic uh, honesty to point out that this government, for all its failures, is less horrible and is less destructive of economic growth and human happiness than most other governments you can think of in the world throughout history, if not all. Okay. Um, and the problem is, it could be all net positive. It doesn't have to have all of the negatives. Uh, we've made some real progress, we got, um, but uh, we have a lot more to do. Europe is saddled with a VAT, uh, which is the difference between the United States. Uni Europe is the United States plus a VAT. Each country is about that much bigger uh, a state uh, than ours. Uh, people, you know, trust people. People move to Texas. Oh, Texas is no good. Well. You can take a look at it if you not mentioned is Texas is a high immigrant state. Immigrants in Texas test better than immigrants in other places, um, as does everybody else. But they're more of the immigrants, and they don't test as well as other guys. But if you're doing apples to apples on immigrants and so on, you are getting Texas does a better job of educating them than other states. If you're from really close to the uh, uh, Cali Cali uh, Canadian border, uh, as Moynihan pointed out, things can be different. But if you want to do apples to apples on, on how well states are doing, the fact that people move there from other states tells you something about um, how, what people think works and what it doesn't. Same thing with people coming to the United States. Europe does not do immigration very well. That's why they're the past and we're the future. China and Japan don't do immigration well. Um, they're going to have real problems maintaining the sort of social welfare uh, transfers as they get older, um, before they get rich, as they have declining, continuing declining uh, labor forces, and ours can be expanding as much as we want to. So, um, let, so Governor, Governor Dean, do no, you, let me just, you agree uh, that we're I, I think it's a, I think it's a, the point is well taken. I deeply appreciate the question. Um, let's look at what we do well and what the Europeans do well. They have a much higher index of, um, of. Uh, wealth equality, if you'll say that. And it is borne out, in fact, in education levels. It's borne out in infant mortality. It's even borne out in happiness <laughs> measures, however that, <laughs> even I will admit that's a little squishy soft social science. Um, and they have more re redistribution of wealth. Um, so they do some things very well and some things not so well. I think this is a much more dynamic economy. The Europeans know that. I'm fascinated by the German economy. You know, we have labor problems here from time to time. Uh, France has labor problems here from time to time. Germany mostly doesn't. Why? Because they have a model for integrating unions and, uh, investor, and investors and corporations, which I think is the envy of the world, and we ought to adopt it here. We can learn from Europe. Europe can learn from us. I was in Europe not long ago, and I was scheduled to come home on a Lufthansa flight, and I was told, oh my god, there's going to be a Lufthansa strike the next day, and I was leaving the day after it, so I'm in a panic. I don't know what to do. I'm sure the airport is going to be a disaster. Oh, no, they only go on strike 
for one day because they, when they get serious in the labor negotiations, that's how they let the management know they're very upset. I mean, so no productivity was lost. Lufthansa didn't use it, lose a bundle of money, and the labor unions realized that that was to their advantage, too, because they could get more if the company did better. I mean, th we need to start looking at European models. The, I thought one of the fool most foolish things Rip Mitt Romney said last time in a long list was that was we don't want to be like Europe. We don't want to be like Europe, and we're not Europe. And I absolutely agree that they have done a lousy job integrating immigrants, and, and it's, they're paying a huge price for that now. And we struggle with that. We do better than anybody else in, on the face of the earth. But there are some things over there. We ought not to blanketly dismiss everything they do in Europe, because there are some things they do, particularly the things that result in the indicators that you just uh, talked about, and labor relations, which we could learn a lot from, and we should learn a lot from, because it would make our economy stronger. Let's go back to this side of the room. Uh, if there are any questions on this side of the room. Gentleman right there. Um, yeah, Ted Olden from the Council on Foreign Relations. I wanted to push a little harder on the defined contribution idea, because I think mm -hmm. in, in the private sector, in a lot of ways it's worked well. It's worked better for the companies in terms of cost control. Uh, for people who are paying into the plans, market returns have been pretty good. But we know that most people are not saving nearly enough for right. retirement. They're simply not putting aside enough money to ensure any kind of security in retirement. Why is that going to work better on the Social Security side? Are you, are you talking about a sort of mandated contribution that everybody's going to have to do that's then going to be managed privately? I mean, how do you prevent people from not looking after their own futures, in effect, in the way they ought to? Thank you. Yeah, I think when, that all of the plans that are talking about reforming uh, Social Security along a Chilean model or some others uh, would take the present amount of money the government takes from you and gives to somebody in Wyoming next week uh, and instead requires you to take that same amount of money and put it into a 401k for yourself. So the reason people don't save enough is if there's, the government lies to you and tells you it's doing the saving for you. Um, and so that kind of Ponzi scheme displaces real savings. Um, and so I think that's one of the great things that we could get the government to stop doing. It's not a good idea for the government to lie to people. It's not a good idea to steal their money. It's not a good idea to tell them there's money when there's not there. The idea that somebody might cheat you, that when the guy talking to you has a $10 trillion um, present value of his unfunded liabilities, or 25 to 35 trillion on uh, Medicare. What? You're not allowed to be part of a conversation if you've stolen 10 trillion or 25, 35 trillion dollars from people and told them that they were going to get it back when they're not um, under this Ponzi scheme that they've set up. Let's cut our losses on that, take care of the people that the government lied to, let's us be honest with the older people and everybody under 55, let's move over and give them that opportunity. And yeah, I would. I do think that it would pay, at least at the beginning as you move forward, to require, at least until they've saved up a certain amount of money, that they could be sure to take care of themselves in case of an accident or old age, that they could do that. Just and one you. second. When I look at the German workforce, I include the Turks. So people who talk about how happy they are, I think, should include everybody in Germany, not just some. Go so ahead. I have just a quick question for you about how you would handle the question of people who, for whatever reason, don't save enough, whether they get screwed by a Bernie Madoff, or whether they didn't save enough on because it was their own fault. So what do you do, and what's our responsibility in a defined contribution program for those failures? Well, I think two things. It, that in terms of having a safety net for somebody who actually uh, gets wiped out by something, um, I think you can look at that when you're talking about 1 or 2 percent of the population or a fraction, and somebody could do the calculation on what percentage of 401ks have turned out to be uh, fraudulent. Uh, when you're comparing that with a 100% rate of fraud under the government program, it seems to me from going from 100% to 1%, you're going, hey, wait, there's 1% here. We've been 50 years with 100%. I think that there should be a little sense of humility on the part of the government uh, who did that. And this bifurcation of Vietnam uh, and the Great Society uh, strikes me as, as a nice trick, but it doesn't work. The same, you should read that speech that Johnson gave. We're going to have smart people get together in a room and make these decisions on your life and so on. That included the draft. That included Vietnam. It was this, the, the whiz kids. They weren't whiz kids who did this. The whiz kids did Vietnam. You know, let me the just same say, government just, hubris okay. leads let, to let, both. Let me just insert one, did one, lead to uh, both. one liner. Very quickly, all so. I did was ask one question to get that yeah. response. So um, I, I, you know, right now, the fraud rate in Social Security is 0%. From the government. They promised there's $10 trillion they've promised you that isn't there. 
That's the fraud. So far, missing. so far, every single person has been paid. Now, we can argue oh. about what's going to happen in the future, but to say that Social Security is 100% fraud, it's, it's very funny and amusing, but it's certainly not true. I'm glad that we brought it back, uh, though. Did, 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 if, the, guy, the guy who runs a Ponzi scheme, if Madoff had said, oh, no, I'll get you eventually, I promise. He hadn't cheated anyone until it got caught. Okay, Everybody got so paid up until a certain point. Government is Bernie Madoff. Let's uh, go back over here, and, I, and I'm glad that we brought it back, Grover, a little bit to the legacy of the Great Society itself, uh, because I would like to try to finish up on that. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, Scott Moore. I'm an International Affairs Fellow uh, here with uh, the Council. Um, so I, I appreciate that this debate has uh, revolved quite a bit around evidence. Uh, I, I feel the need to point out, uh, though, the case against the Great Society relies on trying to prove uh, a counterfactual here. We don't know what would have happened without the Great Society. And to return to a previous question, which I think was very important. If we look around the world, um, we tend to see that some of the most effective uh, social spending programs are uh, forms of conditional cash transfers, which, if I'm not mistaken, would be typically derided uh, here uh, in the United States as handouts. So my question is, do we, uh, do we really have the courage to have this debate about the evidence and what works and what doesn't? Thank you. Thank you. I hope we do. And there's a fascinating article, which I think actually may have been in Foreign Affairs. I can't honestly remember. Um, it was about six or eight months ago, about a project in Kenya uh, which, in which the, uh, the donor organization just gave cash to people with no accountability. And they did that because uh, our USAID model is a great organization, but it fundamentally makes people more dependent, not less dependent. And they just decided to experiment. And it turned out that people used it to improve their lives and their productivity. By, they did not go out and spend it on drugs and gambling and all that good business. They went out and put a new roof on their house or educated their children. So it's a fascinating question. I think you'd have a really tough time from a political point of view trying to convince uh, either American Congress people or their people who they represent that this was a great idea and we ought to, ought to switch over any uh, family uh, support to a system like that. Um, because I think you'd get the same kind of stuff about now that you're drug testing and all this other business. But we ought to be fooling around with ideas like that and see what works and what doesn't. Because right now, I, I would never argue that we couldn't improve. And there is some field work that in fact shows you that outlandish, would appear to be outlandish ideas, which I would have thought was outlandish until I read the research, turns out to be not such an outlandish idea and it's worth pursuing. But re remember, one of us up here says, let's have 50 experiments. I'm willing to have uh, real experience and compare. The status position of, well, we're going to try things, but the federal government will make one big lurch in this direction for 50 years, and that won't work. They'll make another big lurch in that direction. Governments don't react very rapidly. Governments have moved <coughs> to define contribution slowly. Okay, And this is now a liberal idea, by the way. I mean, the, the new lady governor from uh, uh, Rhode Island, I'm sorry, I don't remember her name, but she uh, did significant reform on their pension, defeated the unions in the primary, and won in the general. San Jose, left of center mayor, um, uh, similar uh, reforms. Okay, this, th these New Deal, Great Society programs are crowding out all the resources that I think should be in people's hands, and the liberals think that they'd like to spend, but they first have to pry it out of, of, uh, of those programs. I think we ought to have competition among the ideas, and yes, let's look at Europe. I mean, I think we have a lot to look at Europe. Um, when people talk about the United States as unique, they're usually talking about good things, okay? Like not having the government run the steel mills, um, or not having a draft, usually. Uh, but we're the, we're the country with the dumbest tort laws in the world, and we should look at Europe and, and other countries. You should look at Sweden for school choice. We could look, look at Sweden for their policies on, um, on the death tax, like not having one. Um, so there are a lot of things that Europe does well. There's a reason it's standing. There's a reason the Scandinavian <laughs> countries are still there with high tax rates. They do a bunch of stuff well. We should do that and pass on the things they do less well. Very interesting. Some areas of agreement here. Uh, let's take just a couple more. Yes, sir. Please stand and uh, say your Nick name. Nick Everstadt, American Enterprise Institute. Uh, Governor, since the fraud word came up and since you're a medical doctor, I wanted to ask you about the disability programs. Uh, when you as a doctor see that uh, more people are getting disability payments than working in the manufacturing sector, and you see that the healthiest generation of American workers in history is also the officially most disabled, how, how do you respond to that? How do you think that through? 
I'm, I'm willing to evaluate um, programs. What I'm not willing to do is do what the Republicans just voted to do in the House, which is to blindly cut stuff without knowing what you're talking about. It, there's a big disconnect between, okay, there's problems in the disability program, and then, okay, but so we're not going to transfer $32 billion to su support the program. I, I think it would be nice to actually have some evidentiary da data and some thoughtful look at what needs to be done. Nobody should be in favor of people getting something for nothing. It's not only bad for the country and the taxpayers, it's really bad for the people who are getting the something for nothing, which is why I was interested in welfare reform. On the other hand, I think this blind sort of attacking this welfare queen pink Cadillac stuff is incredibly destructive, it's foolish, and what it does is put the other side, which is me, on the defensive so we, we instinctively resist all the reforms. Why not have a discussion before we start dropping legislation like that and then try to come to some sort of an agreement. I think we could agree that there might be people on disability who don't need to be there. I think the solution is probably not cutting the living hell out of the whole program so that, that let's just say the 90% of the people who do need to be there are getting 18% less. That's the kind of policy problem that we have in this town and in this country right now is that nobody wants to look at the middle and acknowledge that the other side might be right about part of the issue and they have to do the same for you. I, let me just promise on Boehner's behalf that if a Democrat comes up with a piece of legislation that moves in that direction, I think we could get a vote on it in the House. But when the other team puts up nothing to then criticize the Republicans for not doing it differently, I think you then have to say, where is the Democratic Party's willingness to have any reforms at all? We've had six years without reforms, and the next two years is evidently fantasy land. Um, and, um, I think it would pay to have a Democratic Party that is, at the national level, looking at reforms. At some states and some local governments, San Jose, Rhode Island, we're seeing those reforms at the state level. Why? Because states live next to other states and they have to behave or everybody does leave. Just one more quick question and then we're going to have to finish up. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Esther Brimmer now at George Washington University. I'd like to go back to the foreign policy case for actually being one society. The real legacy of the Great Society is not all the, only the, the specific programs which we've been talking about today, but it's the idea that we are one country and that we're responsible for ourselves as an entire country and that everybody's life in this country matters. So it seems to me when we think about the foreign policy case that not only do we need in the 21st century a society where no one is hungry, Everyone gets an adequate education because innovation comes from everywhere, and that everybody is able to participate in a, an economy which would gives them an equal chance to get to the starting line. That's what makes us a great country. And ultimately, in the 21st century, we will need not only a great uh, economy and a great military, but the power of attraction has made the rest of the world want to follow the United States. That's the legacy of the Great Society. Thank any, you. Any final thoughts on that? Yeah, Mark? that's the legacy of. Uh, America's successes, the Great Society impeded that, slowed it down, and damaged it didn't help. We are the country that people want to model ourselves off, and that is, as the governor said, providing the rule of law uh, and providing an, a, a, an opportunity where people are safe, nobody comes and steals your stuff or hits you on the head, and other than that, leaves you alone. I worry a little bit about this one society thing. Really? What religion are we all going to be? You know, what do you mean one society? I, I, when the government decides, again, read this Lyndon Johnson thing. He's going to worry about our soul. He's going to worry about um, our walking out in the, in, the, in the fields. He's going to worry about our leisure time. The government's going to get involved in it. You know, I think the government can and should protect everybody and from, from being hurt by somebody else or robbed by somebody else, protect their house from being broken into or, or their car. But after that, they should leave people alone. And the challenge is um, the government has done so many things, it's become damaging to human progress, slowing economic growth. I mean, th this is a very, very, that I passed this out, but this is the difference between the, the Reagan growth from, when, from the depths of the recession and the Obama growth from the depths of the recession. This is 10 million jobs. This is a lot of income and wealth that middle income people don't have. 10 million people are not going to be the Rockefellers, OK? Those are going to be 10 million people getting the, their first job or getting a job that they don't have now. The damage done by these bad policies, these destructive policies compared to Reagan's, are 10 million households where dad Governor, or mom Governor Dean, you have the final word. Job. Uh, um, final word very briefly. I, I would, ag about them. 
I would agree with Esther. I think the key to the Great Society, we didn't spend a lot of time on this, was in fact the notion of getting everybody to the starting line. There was a whole percent of the population who were not only not at the starting line, but they weren't allowed to vote. And I think everybody has to fully participate. And fully participating, this is where I, this is where I am not a libertarian. Full participation is not, okay, everybody gets to vote. Full participation is you have a decent school system in your neighborhood that's just as good as the school system in my neighborhood. Uh, full participation is, is uh, you, your kids get to co go to college just like mine get to go to college. Otherwise, you're not at the starting line. And when you can't get to the starting line, you never get to the finish line. The genius of this country is, in fact, a lot of ability to do for yourself and work hard and succeed. But if you can't get everybody to the starting line, uh, then you can't succeed. And the reason for that is, going back to what I said about income inequality, when enough people can't get to the starting line, then they stop believing in the vision of the country. That is why the Great Society was important, because it was about getting people to the starting line. And that was its goal. The reality was the opposite. And the debate over the Great Society lives on clearly. Thank you very much. I want to remind everyone uh, that this has been on the record. Thank you, gentlemen.